So uh, this is Sam Seto. You know, he's got his podcast called Majority Report. Just, you know, again, to, to give you a sense of the world in which we live. Um, and now, his production values are very good, so you'll see that. But to give you a sense of the world in which we live, I have 16,000-something subscribers. Sam has 688,000 subscribers. So not just some minor, you know, second class. I mean, important guy within this world of uh, commentary on the progressive side. And, uh, and we're going to, you know, see, see what he has to say. And, and by the way, think about what do you prefer? Medicare for all? America for, or, or just a public option that is a part of Obamacare, which is if you can't buy, if you can't buy health insurance in the private markets, you can basically get it from the government. You pay something, you pay something, um, but you get it from the government. So it's guaranteed. Everybody gets health insurance and uh, the payment is really, really low. And if you don't have any money, you get it for free. Here we go. <laughs> This is interesting. When we talk about Joe Biden's desire to add a public option. They hate Joe Biden, by the way. Uh, to the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Even one that people could buy into. Um, as opposed to just being limited, as the ACA is now, to people who don't have an option of getting health insurance through their employer or any other way and subsidies only being available up to a certain percentage of, of, um, of, of wealth. In this. So the idea, again, is that the public option would allow anybody to get health insurance. It would be completely subsidized, so it, it, you know, it wouldn't be capped. It would be completely subsidized, it, and it would be run by the government. That is, it would be an extension of Medicare, which is, which is really, really important. And, and as you'll see... Sam is not a fan of this because he's a, he's a bunny fan. He wants Medicare for all. Country, certain uh, percentage of poverty. And the idea that, um, you know, costs are, are crazy. The real question is, like, how do you uh, cut costs? Well, here is the former Medicare administrator, Dr. Don Berwick. He so the big issue is, with all these discussions about health care, is costs. How do you, I mean, health care in the United States, supposedly, uh, the, the Democrats, the progressives argue, is very, very expensive. Costs are through the roof. They're really, really expensive. So how do we cut costs? And uh, he's going to refer to a testimony that uh, Obama's healthcare expert uh, made in front of Congress, uh, you know, when, when Obamacare was being passed, who is, who is going to argue that the public option would not cut costs, which is true. Under, this is under Obama. He explains um, why the public option um, at a House hearing will not be sufficient for, uh, for containing medical costs. I'm a little worried about the public option for a kind of technical reason. Insurance companies want to provide insurance to people that don't need it. That is such a bogus argument. I mean, insurance companies don't want to provide insurance to people that don't need it. Insurance companies want to know to what extent you're going to need the coverage and want to have visibility into that so that they can effectively price the insurance. But this idea that insurance companies walk, you know, scour the universe and only insure people who don't need insurance. Well, we all need insurance. That's why we all buy insurance. And we don't know whether we're going to need it or not. But the idea that insurance companies won't insure unhealthy people, they'll insure unhealthy people, they'll just expect to be paid for the risk that they're taking on. So this presentation of insurance as if, you know, uh, insurance, auto insurance companies only want to insure people who will never have an accident. Well, no. They, they're willing to insure, and they take into account that they will insure people who are going to have an accident. They just want to have an effective way to price that so that they continue can make a profit off of insurance pe insuring people like that. So this is such a, it's a sneaky way of saying, oh, these insurance companies, they don't care. 
about sick people. Of course they care about sick people. They just want to know how sick you're going to be so that they can price it, so that they don't lose money overall on insuring the whole pool. That's how they make money. And so anything... No, they make money by creating a pool with who, from whom they charge more and invest the money. And the investment plus what they charge you is more than what you're going to get when you get sick. That's how they make money. They don't make money by ensuring only people who are never going to get sick because nobody never gets sick. And we don't know who's never going to get sick. I mean, it's like, you know, sure, insurance companies would rather their home not burn down. I mean, you would rather your home not burn down. And some homes have a higher risk of burning down and some homes have a lower risk of burning down. And insurance companies would like to charge you enough to compensate for the risk that your house might burn down because it has a higher probability and the other home might not is, is safer in some way. It's not in a fire zone and therefore they would charge them less. And overall in their pool and given the ability to invest the money, they want to make money over time, not on any particular person who is insured. On some people, they lose a lot of money. But overall, over the entire pool, they have to make money. That's how insurance works. But this is a way of couching insurance as if it's, uh, it's, 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 if it's in a free market, there would never be insurance for people who have high fire risk. No, there would be. They would just be charged based on the risk. And yes, the insurance company would lose money on some of those. And they know that. But that's why they put it in a pool. And that's why other people, they're going to make more money on than they're going to lose on you. And overall, they're going to make money. It's just a sneaky way of presenting insurance that is half true, but plays into the, into the, the, the population's kind of uh, distrust and dislike of insurance companies. Done to game risk, so, so the public option would be used by all the people who really need the insurance yeah, and the most. In but that, by the way, is not the insurance company. That's us as human beings gaming the risk. That is, if you offer me insurance that is unrelated to the risk of me getting sick, or insurance that is unrelated to the risk of me getting a fire, and you make it cheap then of course I'm going to go with you rather than go to a commercial insurance company that's actually going to price the policy based on the risk. So if I am obese and have a high risk therefore of diabetes and cancer and, uh, and heart disease, then my health insurance, health insurance is going to cost a lot of money, should cost a lot of money because my risk of being, getting a disease is high. And of course, if somebody else offers me a cheaper policy, certainly if they offer me a free policy, I'm going to go with that. So it's not insurance companies gaming the system. It's the, by, by the government introducing a free or low-cost alternative that is not risk-based, that is, does not categorize people based on risk, they are the ones that are creating a untenable insurance market. They are basically destroying insurance. That, and, and that's what Obamacare to a large extent did. It, it destroyed insurance. So what you're getting is not insurance. What you're getting is just a mechanism of redistribution of wealth from healthy people to sick people. That's not what insurance is. That's not what insurance is. As soon as you take risk pricing out, as soon as you offer an alternative, that is not based on risk, or you prohibit the insurance companies from using risk as a criteria, it's not insurance anymore. It's just another mechanism of redistribution of wealth. So it's so dishonest, because these are not idiots. And, and of course, what, what is he doing? He's blaming insurance companies. This is the way insurance companies game the system. No, it's the way government destroys the insurance market. How they make money. And so anything that can be done to game risk so the that... public option would be used by all the people who really need the insurance yeah, and the if most. I were insurance companies would then try to find ways to have uh, 
people who really need care go to the public option, which would enrich, it would, it would make, it would uh, it'd be a good business case for them, and that's not good for the country. It's not what happens. It's not the insurance companies trying to get them to go, go, go on to the, the, the public option. That is what the incentives mean. That's what has to, by necessity, happen. If I tell you, you pay because you're, you're, you're likely to be sick, you have to pay $1,000, and the government is giving you a policy for $100, you're going to go with the government policy. That's just market incentives. That's just human incentives. But it's much easier, instead of saying government has just destroyed the insurance market, to say greedy insurance companies are manipulating the public to force them into government policies. And by the way, if all the, if all the sick people go into the public option, what happens? Prices in the public option go through the roof. It's not sustainable. And cost of Medicaid expand dramatically. So look, I mean, this is an extension of the argument as to why you can have private insurance if you have Medicare for all. It just needs to be supplemental to what is offered in the context of Medicare for all. So this is where the Democrats are going to come down. You've got to have Medicare for all. Everybody has access to Medicare and everybody's on Medicare automatically. You don't get to choose. And then if you want for special things, and we'll see he struggles to figure out what those special things are. If you want for special things, you can buy, you know, gold-plated insurance on top of the government Medicare that you're going to get. That is what Medicare for all, that's the only plan that works because the problem with the public option is exactly what, they, what this guy said. All the highest risk, all the highest cost patients go to the public option bankrupt the Medicare system. It's bankrupt anyway. We'll get to that. And the insurance companies make a lot of money because they have all the healthy patients. That's exactly what would happen. But that's not the insurance company's fault. That's the fault of the people designing the system. And because if you have it compete with Medicare for all, the insurance companies are going to try and I don't know if they'd be able to he do it if, if, if Medicare for all existed and you still had competing insurance. I, I mean, I guess in my mind, it's an open question. For some, it's not. As to whether you would have enough people who enter into the Medicare for all program so that the risk pool, that is all the people who are involved in the program, is um, the risk is dispersed amongst more people. Yeah, they need, they need healthy and sick people in Medicare for All to make it somewhat work. It still doesn't work, and we'll get to that, but somewhat work. The whole nature of, of insurance in terms of, of health, anyways, and probably not true. Well, the other, and I mean, this is just the way insurance works. It's a small number of people who are going to be responsible for the highest number of costs. That is true, but smart insurance, all insurance companies that is not regulated by government, prices risk in advance to the extent that they have information about the risk. If you speed, if you, you know, and I believe in a free market, there'd be even more ways in which they could, they, they would put a, they, you know, you would get a discount if you, on your, on your auto insurance. I think there are actually auto insurance companies that do this today. You would get a discount if you agreed to have a GPS tracker on your, on your car. And if you drove well, if, if they estimated that you're driving safely, you would get a discount on your car insurance. And if you were driving like a maniac, they would raise your premiums. The same thing with health insurance. They would actually evaluate your health. And to the extent that you were likely to be using a lot of health care, your premium would be higher than if you were jogging all the time, I guess, if, if you assume jogging is good for you, you're healthy, uh, you know, eating well, uh, you know, we're keeping lean, we're, 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 we're building muscle. If you were actually practicing a healthy lifestyle, your insurance costs would be lower. Now, it strikes me that even if you put aside the economics, isn't that just virtuous? If somebody behaves in ways that reduce the risk of disease, 
shouldn't they in justice, in justice, morally, shouldn't they have to pay less for ensuring their health in the future than people who don't? All insurance is risk-based. Otherwise, it's non-insurance. It's not just we have a big pool, some are high risk, some are low risk, we don't know who they are. We just randomly have a big pool and somehow it works. It's not insurance. That's not the business of insurance. That's what government does. That's what government does. Because government can't price it differently. Government prices it all the same. So Medicare, I mean, is based on your income, not on your risk. The, the more income you have, the more you pay into the system. And yet, you get the same benefits as somebody who paid little into the system. You get in whether you're healthy or unhealthy makes no difference. You pay based on your income. So all it is is a way to penalize rich people. And it's not insurance. Medicaid is not unequivocally insurance. It's a massive redistribution scheme from rich to poor, from young to old. That's what Medicare is. Rich to poor, young to old. And you might be okay with redistribution systems. But don't kid yourself that Medicare is somehow an insurance. It has none of the characteristics of an insurance. But the point is, we don't know who those people will be over the course of a lifetime. But you could know. You could know. You could take their blood pressure. You could take their weight. You could take their blood. You could. Oh, my God. Now I'm going to say something completely unacceptable. You could even check their DNA and see how susceptible they are to diseases. Imagine a true free market where insurance companies asked you if you're willing to give your DNA. And if the DNA turned out to be on the healthy side, that is, you are less susceptible to certain diseases, you would get really, really cheap coverage. And if your DNA sucked, then you would have more expensive coverage. But that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, it's true. The risk is not your fault, not there. It just is. But so what? Insurance companies should take all the available information into account in pricing insurance. Now, even with DNA, there's no guarantee that you will be sick. Now, there's also other options. You know, what about pre-existing conditions? Uh, somebody on the left would jump up. Well, one thing that a free market would supply, and, and this makes complete sense, is you would be able to buy pre-existing condition insurance. That is insurance that covered you against losing your insurance policy if you had pre-existing conditions. For example, you could buy it before the baby was born. And again, even that insurance might be priced based on risks, based on the parent's lifestyle, based on the parent's DNA. So, I mean, once you have a free market, the options are unbelievable in terms of what becomes available to you. What becomes available to you, right? All right, by the way, studying somebody's DNA is not racist. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with your specific individual DNA. And if fat is associated with lack of health, then fat is associated with lack of health. We are objectivists. We look at facts, nothing else. Facts, not collectives, not, not insulting people. Just look at facts. All right, let's see what Sam has to say. Now, once you've identified them, if you're the insurance company and you want to insure people, you want to make sure those people are not part of your risk pool. Why not? If you can charge them more, you might be able to still make money off of them. And you want to offload them. You can only offload them if there's some way to offload them too, like a state-run program that doesn't care about risk because it's not insurance. And if you offload them into a system where only a certain number of people are paying into the system because they're buying in as opposed to it being taxation on everyone, you'll have a higher percentage of people who will need the service 
And that's when insurance breaks down. It's amazing how even progressives understand some limited basic economic principles. Incentives work when they think it serves their cause. Then incentives work. I guess they understand that when you offer something for free relative to offering something that's expensive and what the expensive is price based on risk and the free stuff is not based on risk, then everybody who is high risk will go to the free stuff. That they get. But they don't get that when you offer homeless people free housing, they're going to be more homeless people because you've offered something free. So they're going to be more people who want the free stuff. So people are going to leave their home, stop paying rent, become homeless in order to gain the free stuff that you're offering them, which is exactly what's happening in L.A. right now and, and in California because there's so much free stuff being offered that, you know, it, it, in the short run, it might be worth being homeless. So... I think the question of, of private insurance is overblown. Everybody needs to pay into the system. If they want to get a different insurance program, that's fine. But I also think you need to make like the vast majority of, of, of doctors and service providers also be part of the system. Now, this is important. Because everybody talks about how much Medicare for All is going to cost. Everybody talks about increases in taxes. And I don't think that's the issue. Even from an economic perspective, I don't think the fact that taxes will have to go up is the issue. And I think you'll find that once Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders offer their plans, they will have all kinds of ways in which taxes don't go up that much and they only go up on the rich. And, and if you take out all the premiums you have to pay for health insurance and you get to keep those, then what they're going to argue is if you just take that amount and you pay it into Medicare, then your taxes are not going to go up beyond what you're already paying for health insurance. So the issue is not with Medicare for all. What is going to happen to taxpayers as taxpayers? Now, you all know, I think, the, the, the issue is morality, but we're going to put even the morality aside. We're going to focus on what is the real economic damage of Medicare for all. And it's not taxes. All right, let's see what he says here, because this is important. Easy to do, I think. You can't, be, uh, you, you can't get accreditation unless you take a certain percentage of Medicare patients. And at that point, if everybody's paying in and everybody has access to the same doctors... Same doctors, egalitarianism. It really doesn't matter, in my mind, uh, what happens with uh, private insurance or not. Now, notice, the way, what they want to do, and what Medicare for all, you know, if you have Medicare for all, then if there's no private insurance, then doctors have to be treated, have to treat Medicare patients, because that's all there is. Now, what he's saying is, even if you have a private insurance, what you have to do is force doctors, and I emphasize force, coerce doctors into taking a certain number of Medicare patients. Later on in the clip, he will say that he means like 80, 90% of their patients should be Medicare patients. Now, what does this actually do? So notice that behind Medicare for All is a massive, massive scheme to coerce doctors, hospitals, drug companies, biotech companies, all the entire medical production, the real damage of Medicare for all is not the taxes. The real damage is to the producers of healthcare. And this is something nobody ever talks about. Healthcare is something that has to be produced. Somebody has to produce healthcare, whether it's doctors, whether it's pharmaceutical companies, whether it's pharmacists, whether it's scientists, whether it's biotech companies, uh, medical device inventors and companies, uh, hospitals, nurses, healthcare 
has to be produced by all these people. Now today, today, before we get Medicare for all, today we have about 121 million people. Let me say that again. 121 million people today are on either Medicare or Medicaid. It's about 53 million people over 65 who are on Medicare and about 68 million, 68 million people on Medicaid. 121 million people on Medicaid and Medicaid. Another 177 million people on commercial insurance. So today what happens is the people in Medicare and Medicaid when they go see a doctor or they go to the hospital, Medicare and Medicaid pays the bill. Now, what does that mean? That means that the doctor doesn't get what he wants. The doctor doesn't get what he negotiates. The doctor doesn't necessarily get enough money to cover his costs. What the government, what the doctor and the hospital get. And if, and if uh, drug companies, if Medicare negotiates as a plan with, with drug companies, same thing will happen to drug companies. What they get is what Medicare decides they get. And often, what Medicare decides they get is below their costs. Indeed. The reason healthcare is so expensive for all of us who have private insurance, because not only are we subsidizing Medicare and Medicaid for people through our taxes, we are subsidizing people on Medicare and Medicaid through the cost of health care. We are subsidizing it because the doctor, on average, gets 22% less for Medicare than from, than, than from private insurance. 22% less. Now, in some specialities, they get 75% less. They get 20, 25 cents on the dollar. So in general, when a Medicare patient comes to see a doctor, they get paid ridiculously low rates. Well, they need to survive. You know, getting a, getting a, a medical degree is, I don't know, seven years of college, it's residency, it's massive student loans, and these are really, really smart people who probably could have gone into become lawyers, become programmers, become a, a, a whole array of different fields. They have to make a profit. They have to make a return on all the investment that they've made in their profession. Well, Medicaid comes in and prices it below at a rate that's not profitable. So what do they have to do? They raise prices on the rest of us. So all of us who have private insurance are paying way more than we should to subsidize Medicare and Medicaid. Now imagine, now that is true in hospitals, where massively Medicare and Medicaid pay sometimes right now 40% less than what private insurance does. 40% less than what private insurance does. That's true in every aspect of the healthcare industry. Now, what does Medicare for All do? Medicare for All, instead of taking 177 million people, subsidizing 121 million people, which is damn immoral, evil, disgusting, horrific, nasty, and the result is a very high cost of healthcare for those of us on private healthcare. But on top of that, once you have Medicare for All, Everybody is now in the Medicare, Medicaid pool. That means every dollar spent on health care is 20, 40, 75% less than what we'd have been spent with private insurance, which means doctors now can't make up the losses from taking Medicare patients. Now they're just losing money. Now, what does that do? That means doctors stop working, retire early, don't go to medical school, don't try, 
why bother? You're not going to be paid for it. You're not going to get a return for it. And indeed, the political, the political, as healthcare costs expand and as more and more people retire and they go, well, everybody's on Medicare, but they use more healthcare, so the costs go up. What do you think is going to happen? The government's going to have all these expenses. What are they going to do? They're going to start cutting, but they're not going to cut explicitly. They're not going to say, we're not going to pay for your appendix. We're not going to pay for your cancer. What they're going to say is, oh, no, no, we'll continue to pay, but we're going to pay the doctors less. We're going to pay the hospitals less. We're going to pay less for an MRI. We're going to pay less for the drugs. And what's that going to result in? Less profitability for doctors, hospitals, drug companies, healthcare providers, producers of all kinds. Less profitability for them, if any. Some of them go out of business. Some of them, you know, retire, which is like going out of business. Others just lower the quality. You can see that in Puerto Rico where there's a shortage of doctors. What happens? Huge waiting lines. You know, uh, they only have 10 minutes per patient. They can't treat you properly. They can't give you the time, proper time. I mean, the doctors are trying. They're good doctors. They really make an effort, but they can't. They're making something like 15 bucks per patient. Well, how many patients a day do you have to see if you're only going to make 15 bucks per patient? A lot. A lot. Now, quality of care goes down. MRI facilities shut down. Hospitals shut down. And because there's less profit, if any, there's almost no research being done. And what happens with Medicare for All, which is much worse, much, much, much worse than the taxes, is the, the entire production of healthcare collapses. It collapses. And particularly if you don't want immigrants, immigrant doctors who are willing to work for cheap, it completely is gone. This is why there's shortages of doctors in many European countries. This is why you have to wait in line. This is why healthcare is rationed. And this is why there's no medical innovation or barely any medical innovation outside the United States because there's no profits to be had. Why would I innovate if I can't benefit from it? So Medicare for all is not just a problem that our taxes are gonna go up. Who cares? I mean, I care. But as long as I can get good health care, if they have to pay higher taxes, I don't care. What's really, really, really bad about Medicare for all is that it will cause a complete collapse. Well, at least a slow, steady, systematic deterioration in the production side. And that's the side progressives and on the right have no conception of. Somebody said on the chat that there's now an article in the National Review, a conservative approach to Medicare for all. Yeah. Collectivists don't care. They don't understand economics. They don't care about producers. They don't care what it does to doctors. They don't understand the role of the mind. They don't understand why doctors need freedom. Hospitals need freedom. Drug companies need freedom. Medical device inventors and manufacturers need freedom in order to continue to innovate, to continue to expand, to continue to produce great products. What else happens? Well, doctors now only have 10 minutes to see you. In those 10 minutes, they can't really think. All they do is follow government guidelines for particular treatments of the particular symptoms you seem to have. There's no in-depth analysis. There's no innovations, and there's no thinking outside of the box. There's no, if you ever seen the series House, years and years ago, House, there are no houses. Nobody can afford a house. Well, you can't afford a house because it's Medicare for all. Everybody gets the same. Everybody seems the same doctors. That's what Sam said. The whole idea of socialized medicine, the whole idea of Medicare for all, is disgustingly immoral, it's destructive, it's anti-life, it's anti-health care. And everybody suffers. Everybody suffers. And it's again not because taxes go up, it's because production. 
both in quantity and in quality, plummets, goes down because you can't pay for it. And because centralized planning, centralized payment systems, which are basically centralized planning, dictate one size fit all medicine. So the whole dream of life extension, the whole dream of living long, healthy lives is the idea of personalized medicine. Medicine that is personalized to you, to your DNA, to your particular health needs, that there is no one size fit all. Medicare for all is one size fit all medicine. Socialized medicine is one size fit all medicine. And it is a disaster and it would cripple progress and it would make it impossible for us to achieve that personalized medicine that would allow us to live a long, long time into the future. Now, there are many philosophies that would offer that to an individual. Oh, yes. There are religions that offer it. There yes. are forms of government that offer it. How does... Not forms of government. That's politics. That's a different branch. That comes later. Well, yes, but governments in some areas, in some instances, would define for you choices or dictate to you oh, yeah. how to live your life. Yeah. But I'll retract governments and just say religions are yeah. philosophies. How does objectivism differ from the philosophies that many of us have been exposed to in our youths? Uh, philosophies based upon religions, theologians, dogmatists. The f very first difference. Uh, objectivism tells you that it is not right, it is not proper to men to take anything on faith. Religion is a matter of faith. You accept a religion emotionally or because you were born to it. You have not chosen it rationally. What objectivism will tell you is that reason, man's reason is his basic means of survival. That is the most important faculty which he has and he has to guide his life and make his choices by means of his rational faculty. He has to make his own choices, but he has to know how to make them. It is immoral for him to act on his emotions, to be guided by the whim of the moment. That objectivism holds as very wrong, very immoral. And morality, in fact, consists of following your reason to the best of your ability. So that rationality is the basic virtue from which all the others proceed. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time, so I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity, go to yourownbookshow.com slash support, or go to subscribestar.com, yourownbookshow, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...